So yes, I am a neuroscientist who studies how our brains respond to music. And my particular area of interest is rhythm. Now, I might be a little bit biased, but I believe that rhythm is the most important, basic, fundamental aspect of music. You can take away all of the melodies and the harmonies, forget about keys, and don't worry about scales, and what you have left is still undeniably music. So forget about me, I could just listen to that for the next couple of hours. So what I'd really like to talk to you about today is our uniquely human response to rhythm and how it differs from other animals in the animal kingdom. I'll also be talking about what goes on inside our brains when we're listening to rhythm. Now, one of the most fascinating things about rhythm is that it's completely inextricably linked to movement. So if you see someone with earbuds in, if you catch even a little bit of a head nod or a toe tap, you know immediately they're listening to music. Moving to music is also a cultural universal. It's found in every human society. And I used to say that humans are the only species that has ever been shown to move spontaneously to music. And then along came Snowball. Snowball is a sulfur-crested cockatiel. His favorite band is the Backstreet Boys. And his dancing has made him a little bit of a YouTube star. Let's do it. Come on. So I think you'll agree he's got some moves. <laughs> now that was actually a clip from an experiment conducted by neuroscientist Annie Patel and his colleagues, and they wanted to scientifically record and analyze Snowball's movement to see if he really was synchronizing to the beat the way that a human might. And although it turns out much of the time Snowball is very accurately tracking the beat, there are also periods where he's not really on the beat at all. In addition, Snowball really prefers speeds of about 125 beats per minute. So if you slow the music down too much or speed it up too much, he's no longer able to synchronize if it goes too far from that 125 beats per minute. So although this is probably the closest example that I know of, of a non-human animal moving to music, Snowball still doesn't show the sort of flexibility or accuracy that a human does moving to music. Now, apart from Snowball, there are other examples in the animal kingdom of synchronous rhythmic behavior, thinking about chorusing frogs or flashing fireflies. However, these two also differ, differ in fundamental ways from what we do to music. So if you think about what a cricket does, for example, it's producing the same sound over and over again, separated by roughly the same time interval. What humans can synchronize to is far more complex. Take this example from Aphex Twin. There's another key difference, and I alluded the, to this a little bit with Snowball, and that's that most animal synchronous behavior only takes place within a very narrow range of rates whereas humans can synchronize to quite a wide range of rates. So we're capable of putting our arms around our friends and swaying back and forth to a slow ballad or taking our lighter or our lighter app that we've downloaded to our phone and swaying that across. And then we can turn around and jump up and down really quickly in time to a very fast techno beat. The final difference, and I think perhaps the most important one, is that most animal synchronization takes place in the same modality. So croaking sounds are synchronized with croaking sounds, or light flashes are synchronized with other light flashes. However, what humans do crosses modality. So we usually make a silent movement, say your favorite dance move, and we synchronize that to a sound. Our movement does not need to make a sound in order for us to be in sync. We are perfectly capable of taking movement and synchronizing it to a sound without having to match modalities. So this makes our behavior much more complex um, than that we see in other animals. Now, I've been talking about frogs and crickets and birds. These are all pretty far removed from us on the evolutionary tree. If we want to know where our human response to rhythm comes from, we'd probably be better off looking at more closely evolutionarily related animals, such as monkeys. 
Now, Dr. Hugo Merchant at the National University of Mexico has been doing exactly this. He has been training monkeys to move to the beat. Now, before we see how the monkeys do this, I'd like to see how you, a nice representative sample of human subjects, do the same task that the monkeys do. So it's a simple task we call synchronization continuation in the neuroscience literature. All it involves is you're going to hear some tones, beep, 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 beep. And what I want you to do is clap along to the tones. As soon as you've got the beat that these tones are making, you're going to clap along. Then after the tones finish, I'd like you to carry on clapping for a little bit, um, just even after the sound is finished, maybe four or five claps. Now, the trick here is to clap as soon as you've got the beat. You don't want the tones to have already finished before you start clapping. So are you ready? You sure? Because if you do worse than the monkeys, we're both going to look bad. <laughs> All right, here we go. Very good. You were so good, you actually drowned out the beeps themselves, which makes it a little bit harder to do the task. But you did a fantastic job. So now let's see what the monkeys do on this task. Now, monkeys don't find clapping or even tapping very easy to do. So in this task, you'll see that the monkey's hand is resting next to a lever. And the sound will start. And the monkey will, when he's ready, he's got the beat, he'll pull the lever instead of clapping. So here we see what the monkey does. So you'll see that the monkey did the task in a very different way from how you did the task. What the monkey does is react to each tone. So he uses the sound as a cue to initiate that movement, which means by the time the movement actually occurs, the sound itself is long gone. And every beep is like this. He never catches up and starts synchronizing with the beat the way that you did. What you did is something we call entrainment. This is quite a special feature of human synchronization. So as soon as you heard those tones, you set up your own internal beat, and then you use that internal representation to initiate your movement before any sound had occurred at all. This meant that then you made the sound at the same time as the beeps. You also carried on using that internal representation when you were clapping at the same rate after the beeps had stopped. So we don't really know yet why it is that monkeys don't show entrainment and humans do. However, there are studies going on both in my lab and the labs of others to examine brain responses in both humans and monkeys to see if we can see where these differences come from. However, what we do know is this entrainment is completely crucial to your experience of music. Your entrainment is what allows, for example, a saxophone player in a jazz ensemble to be a little bit ahead of the beat or a little bit behind the beat to give the music a different feel. If you didn't have an idea of where that beat was supposed to be, you would never know that the saxophone player was a little bit ahead or a little bit behind, and you would never experience the emotion that that leading and lagging can induce. Now, one of the neat things about our internal beat is it's induced incredibly quickly. You guys started clapping within two or three tones max, and in music it happens just as quickly. Sometimes our internal beat is so strong we can feel it even when the music itself is almost silent. This is a clip that was brought to my attention by musicologist Justin London. It's called Hoochie Coochie Man, and it was recorded by Muddy Waters. I'm just going to play the beginning, and I'd like you to pay attention, see if you feel your internal beat in the silences, and see how quickly it is that you feel the beat. So within a few notes, dun, 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 we're all there. Now, what's amazing about this is you didn't have to be trained to learn how to do this. No one told you, oh, this is what we're supposed to respond to when we hear music. And you couldn't even explain to someone, probably, how it is you go about doing it. Yet it happens spontaneously and automatically in response to music. So I was really interested in how it is that this response comes about. So I used MRI scanning to look at brain activity in response to rhythms. Now, we had people listen to rhythms while we were looking at their brain activity, but because we really wanted them to pay attention to the rhythms and not be thinking about what they wanted to have for dinner that night, we gave them a task to do. Now, I'm going to give you the same task to try. It involves listening to a rhythm that's presented once, 
then hearing the same rhythm a second time, and then deciding if the third rhythm is the same as the first two or different from the first two. So the first two rhythms are always the same, and then you decide if the third rhythm is same or different. So here we go. So I'd like you to raise your hand if you think it was the same. And raise your hand if you think it was different. Wow, this is a good crowd. <laughs> That's correct. So the third one was different. And as you can see, you have to really pay attention to the rhythms in order to make that distinction. The other thing we told our participants was during the scan, while they were listening to rhythms, to stay absolutely still. So no tapping or toe moving, no counting along in their heads. Really what we wanted to see was the response to rhythm when people were staying completely still, making no movement at all. And this is what we found. So on the uh, right side of the screen, you'll shortly see a picture of the brain as if the top of the brain has been removed, and there's auditory cortex activity. Now, the auditory cortex, located right by the ears, is responsible for processing of sound. This wasn't too surprising to us, because we were playing our participant sounds, so we would expect sound areas to be active. However, all the other areas that we saw did surprise us. So here on the right side of the screen, this is a view as if you've just taken the forehead away and you're looking at a person straight on. All of these other areas are areas that are responsible for the processing of movement. So they're involved in the selection, control, and initiation of movement. We call them motor areas. Now these motor areas are responding even though the participants are staying perfectly still and have no intention of moving. They're just doing our task. This was really surprising to us, and we thought this was quite an interesting finding, suggesting that rhythm is driving movement areas in the brain even when people aren't moving. So we wanted to see if this was the same thing that was going on in music. I did spend a lot of time making those rhythms, but if I'm honest with myself, I can acknowledge I'll never make the Billboard Top 100. <laughs> So how do we know that the response we're seeing during these rhythms would be the same response when people are listening to real music? So we did a comparison. So first, people heard rhythms, just like the ones you heard before. Here's a reminder. And this is the brain response that we saw. So this is as if you've just taken the front of the brain, or the front of the head off, moved it to the side, and you're looking straight on the person. And we see motor areas again. We see the supplementary motor area in the middle, premotor cortex up to the side, and the basal ganglia deep within the brain. Then we played our subject's music, and this is an example of the sort of clips we used. And this is the response that we saw the exact same motor areas are responding. So rhythm seems to drive motor area responses, whether it's in the context of tone sequences or in the context of music. This suggests that music is not just about sound, but also fundamentally about movement. Now, the neat thing about this is this means we can actually take music, turn the whole thing on its head, and use music to change activity in motor areas of the brain. This has the potential for therapeutic applications. So motor areas of the brain are commonly affected both by stroke and by degenerative disease. One example of this is Parkinson's disease. So Parkinson's patients have difficulty initiating movement, and they often freeze in the midst of making a movement. In addition, their movements can be unsteady or slow. Now, people have tried to use music to help Parkinson's patients' movements in the past, and there is some benefit. However, the benefit seems to be very variable. Some patients show a big improvement, and some patients show hardly any improvement at all. In my lab, we think this is probably because our individual responses to music are also highly individual or very variable. The thing that gets me out onto the dance floor might not even get a toe tap from you. So we're currently allowing patients to select their own music based on their ratings of how much it makes them want to move. We're also looking at the importance of how familiar the music is, whether it's enjoyable, and even whether there are particular genres that certain patients really prefer to move to. And the last video that I'd like to show you today, I think, demonstrates why we're so excited about this research. It just shows a patient who's uploaded a video of himself up to YouTube. He's moving around in his living room. And you can see some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease that this patient has, for example, freezing in the midst of movements. 
In the beginning of the clip, there's silence, and then he goes and puts on some music that he himself has selected. So there's some freezing right there. So I think you'll agree, the effects of music on movement can be very powerful. So next time you're listening to some tunes and you maybe feel like getting your inner wiggle on, I say go for it. You'll be celebrating something that makes you, as a human, unique. Thank you. <laughs>